we will discuss here the vitamin B complex. The vitamin B complex is composed of a lot of different chemically unrelated compounds. They're diverse, they do different things, uh, so you really wouldn't think to put these all in one category together. It doesn't really make any logical sense, but uh, that, that's how it is. So um, we're going to talk about seven different uh, vitamin B um, members. Uh, one we're not going to talk about is vitamin B5, which is pantothenic acid. Um, you can look that up on your own. Uh, I haven't seen any questions on the USMLE that address pantothenic acid, um, but these other ones uh, are pretty important. So uh, we'll go ahead with this. So these B vitamins are a class of chemically diverse water-soluble compounds. They serve as cofactors for many of uh, the most fundamental and critical biochemical processes in the human body. So deficiencies of uh, some of these vitamins can be uh, really devastating and severe. Now these are water-soluble, so unlike the fat-soluble vitamins, which are A, D, E, and K, it's because you can get rid of these in the kidney, it's very difficult to have an excess of these water-soluble vitamins, which include B and C. So uh, you don't really see the hypervitaminoses that you would see in like A, D, E, and K. Um, and even if you do have an excess, if there are symptoms, it's not as problematic. Deficiencies of B vitamins, on the other hand, continue to be a global health problem, and particularly in developing countries. Another important pearl is that patients who are deficient in one B vitamin are often deficient in another. So if you have a patient with a confirmed vitamin B deficiency, you should really, really, really uh, be suspicious for another one and look for signs of a, another uh, vitamin B deficiency, even though uh, symptoms might not uh, exist. Uh, definitely uh, also important for clinical practice. Um, because of the fact that patients uh, may have multiple vitamin B deficiencies, they may have uh, symptom overlap, symptoms both of a niacin deficiency and a biotin deficiency or a folate deficiency and a thiamine deficiency at the same time. On the USMLE, I expect they're only going to give you a patient with one vi vitamin B deficiency at a time, but in real life, it's a little bit more complicated than that. These are the vitamin B uh, chemicals. So thiamine, which is B1, riboflavin is B2, thi uh, niacin, which is B3, pyridoxine, which is B6, biotin, folic acid, and cobalamin, which is B12. So we'll start off with thiamine. Thiamine is found uh, in whole grain foods, meat, poultry, and fish, eggs, milk, leafy greens, vegetables, beans, nuts, and seeds, and oranges and tomatoes. Uh, so a diverse amount of foods, which is good because that means we don't see vitamin deficiency as much um, as you might see vitamin D deficiency where it's not commonly found in foods naturally. Uh, however, there are there is one really important patient population where you do see vitamin D deficiency and that's alcoholics. We'll talk about that. So vitamin B1 or thiamine is a cofactor for a lot of different enzymes that are needed for a vast array of activities, but most prominently it's needed for the synthesis of acetylcholine and GABA. And so when we see vitamin B1 deficiency, uh, there are some neurologic issues that can, uh, that can happen here. So Wernicke-Korsakoff syndrome is uh, one of the, uh, the, the most commonly known and you tend to see that in alcoholics because they are a particular risk for vitamin B1 deficiency. Vitamin B1 is also important for lipid synthesis and myelin production. Deficiency of vitamin B1 can be due to malnutrition, uh, di diet, GI or liver disease, uh, but most commonly in the United States it's due to alcoholism. Uh, so the particular diets where you're going to see uh, thiamine deficiency, and you should be aware of this, are going to be uh, diets where the food is either uh, really processed or really refined, um, because through those processes, you are really stripping the food of their vitamins. So in the East, in Asian countries, uh, they, uh, where their diet is, uh, is based on rice, uh, if they're eating white rice, uh, then they can develop a thiamine deficiency, and this is called oriental beriberi. And beriberi is just a, uh, a general term for thiamine deficiency. So we call it oriental uh, or eastern beriberi. 
and uh, in the West, uh, if the if the diet is really based on uh, refined wheat flour, white breads, uh, you can get berry berry as well. We call that Occidento or Western berry berry. The sources of thiamine, as mentioned, include meat, particularly pork, fish, liver meats, brown rice, oats, legumes, and enriched cereals. As mentioned, beriberi is the clinical syndrome uh, that results from thiamine deficiency, but there's really two different kinds of beriberi, and usually you'll see both of these in, uh, to some extent in a patient with thiamine deficiency. So dry beriberi is uh, something that affects the nervous system, primarily because uh, B1 is necessary for acetylcholine and GABA production, and so if you don't have thiamine, you're uh, going to have low levels of those neurotransmitters. And so these, uh, the symptoms of this can include irritability, amnesia, mental status changes, muscle tenderness, peripheral neuritis, and ataxia. Uh, later on, you can have loss of deep tendon reflexes, cranial nerve palsies, particularly difficulties with swallowing, and ultimately coma. And the dry berry berries can be, uh, can be split up into a Wernicke syndrome and a Korsakoff syndrome. Uh, which affect the uh, nervous system and then psychiatric uh, issues, respectively. We'll look at those in a little bit more depth. Wet beriberi affects the heart, and it looks really similar to classic congestive heart failure, but if you see this in a child, um, children typically don't develop congestive heart failure, so uh, be suspicious for that. Uh, symptoms include uh, surround right heart uh, failure, and so that's going to lead to edema, tachycardia in order to, uh, to, to increase the uh, amount of blood that's getting out of the heart, and ultimately you'll get right-sided cardiomegaly, eventually left-sided cardiomegaly as the congestive heart failure decompensates. If you look at the EKG, you'll see low voltage complexes, QT prolongation, and that's probably a uh, nerve issue, and then inverted T waves and cardiomegaly. Like I said, most severely uh, thiamine, Thiamine deficient patients uh, will have both a combination of dry and wet berry berry. So you don't see these uh, necessarily exclusively because they're both due to deficiency of the same vitamin. Some classic syndromes that are related to thiamine deficiency, and these would be considered a dry berry berry. You see these particularly in the U.S. and alcoholics include Wernicke's encephalopathy and Korsakoff psychosis. Again, you usually see the two of these together, and that's called Wernicke-Korsakoff syndrome. Wernicke's encephalopathy is a neurologic condition, and that's characterized by these cranial nerve uh, issues, ophthalmoplegia. Uh, they can also have issues with ataxia, which is affecting the cerebellum, and confusion. Uh, other symptoms uh, to dry beriberi may be present. Uh, in children, uh, they can have uh, this Wernicke's encephalopathy uh, that develops uh, due to, uh, not due to, but uh, precipitated by an infection. Korsakoff psychosis is a psychiatric condition, and this is characterized by uh, really severe amnesia, and it's uh, anterograde and retrograde. So not only do they forget the things that uh, happened before their Korsakoff psychosis developed, but they'll have difficulty forming new memories. They'll usually make up for this, um, and that's done by confabulation. So if you, uh, if you ask the patient about something that happened, it'll be, and, and you have the patient's parent or wife or whatever uh, sitting there, uh, they'll be like, no, that, that, that's not true. But the patient will be insistent that uh, that was actually the case. That's what confabulation is. Um, they also have apathy and minimal talking. Uh, interestingly, procedural memory remains intact, so these patients, uh, even though they, uh, let's say you've got uh, a, uh, a professional who, uh, who um, I don't know, let's, uh, let's say uh, it's somebody who drives, these patients will often still be able to drive because that's all procedural memory, and this, uh, with Korsakoff psychosis, they have issues with, uh, with, uh, with memory as far as events. Uh, but their procedural memory will remain intact. So let's say it's like a, a chef who makes omelets. They'll still remember how to, you know, when to crack the egg and when to add the oil and all that stuff. 
The workup for B1 deficiency is going to be a uh, basic metabolic profile with calcium and magnesium levels. You want to get a CBC with smear. Uh, if they're, uh, The reason you want to do this, um, and you're going to see a similar workup for all of these things, uh, but you're really looking for, uh, you're, you're really screening the patient for all vitamin B deficiencies. So you want to get a BMP with calcium magnesium levels. You want to get a CBC with smear because folate and B12 deficiencies may be present. Uh, and in those cases, you can have a, a, a macrocytosis. Um, and then also, uh, you can get iron studies as well, uh, if, if that's warranted, if you have a microcytosis. Echocardiography is something that you definitely want to get if wet symptoms are present. Uh, an MRI of the brain is useful. Usually it's going to be the basal ganglia area that's affected. And then thiamine levels can be obtained. Uh, you should also consider obtaining other B levels, especially B12, uh, in patients with, uh, with uh, B deficiency. Management for thiamine deficiency is going to be intramuscular thiamine, and that's going to supply a depot of thiamine that can be absorbed, and then you'll uh, follow that up with, uh, with PO thiamine for six weeks. Manage any other comor comorbidities, particularly alcoholism. I know we're talking about growth and development, which is pediatrics, but vitamin deficiencies can happen in absolutely anybody. Uh, consultation with a dietitian is useful uh, if there's dietary issues, and then any other specialists, neurologists, psychiatrists can be useful depending on the patient's symptoms. Um, also, cardiologists if they have wet symptoms, and then follow up the patient to monitor their progress. Vitamin B2 is riboflavin. It gets its name uh, from uh, flavus, and flavus is the Latin word for yellow, and the reason for that is because this is a pigment and it appears yellow. Uh, so this can be, uh, this is found in cheese, nuts and almonds, uh, meat, milk, oily fish, uh, tuna and salmon, eggs, mushrooms, sesame seeds, spinach. So back in the day, they used to put milk in these, uh, in, in glasses um, when they delivered it or when you got it, and now they're in cartons. And the reason for that is not, well, it's probably partially because glass is expensive, but uh, um, the reason for this is that riboflavin is heat sensitive, or sorry, light sensitive. It's light labile, uh, and light will deactivate the uh, the riboflavin and render it useless. So um, now they put milk in uh, in these uh, cartons, and uh, that uh, allows the milk to retain its riboflavin. So riboflavin is part of the flavoprotein enzymes, such as FAD, and these are necessary in redox reactions, donating and receiving protons. This is important, of course, then for cellular metabolism, especially people who have a high turnover, uh, sorry, especially for tissue that has a high turnover rate. So that's things like skin, your stomach lining, um, all of that uh, intestinal lining, those all have a high turnover rate. Uh, and so that's, uh, and also blood cells, uh, that has a high turnover rate too. Uh, and so uh, this is uh, where you're going to see most of these symptoms. Uh, as we mentioned, uh, riboflavin is photosensitive. Uh, so deficiency with riboflavin is typically related to malabsorption and malnutrition. Um, it can also be seen in prolonged treatment with certain medications like probenicid, which is given for gout. Phenothiazine, such as chlorpromazine, which is an antipsychotic, not really prescribed much anymore, and oral contraceptives. Manifestation of deficiency is chiefly seen in the tissues that have a high turnover rate. So skin, uh, blood, uh, eyes. So where do we see this? We see this uh, around the mouth. Uh, the mouth also has a high tur turnover rate, so you can see angular colitis. Um, which, remember, you can also see in vitamin D overload. Uh, in the mouth, you'll see glossitis. That can be like canker sores, or, uh, uh, or um, you can also get uh, this glossitis, which is uh, you, uh, the, the tongue becomes red and sort of swollen, and you lose that characteristic texture of the tongue. I'll show you some pictures of that. In the eyes, you can see red eyes and photophobia. Uh, hematologically, you can see uh, an, an anemia, and this is a normocytic anemia uh, because riboflavin is important for eryth erythropoiesis. So it's going to be, an, you'll, have, you'll have normal red blood cells, but you're not going to have as many of them. 
and in children, this can lead to growth retardation. So I put in bold face here uh, the symptoms that typically are described to you on the USMLE. So here's angular chelitis. This is a sort of mild angular chelitis, uh, but ultimately this angular chelitis will spread out and get really bad. Okay, this is actually glossitis, not angular chelitis. So if you look here, um, you see the normal texture of the tongue and then uh, it becomes uh, redder and more uh, uh, softer when you, when you look at the glossitis tongue. So to work up, you'll get a CBC with smear, a BMP uh, with calcium and magnesium levels. Uh, for testing riboflavin levels directly, uh, you get a 24-hour urinary riboflavin level. Remember, all these B vitamins uh, come out of the urine. And then assess for other possible causes based on the symptoms. To manage this, it's uh, riboflavin replacement. If a patient is getting riboflavin uh, replacement, you need to inform them that riboflavin uh, supplements need to be taken with food. Uh, the absorption is way better uh, with food. Consultation with a dietitian is useful for any patient that has a dietary problem. And then if this is medic uh, medication related, you should consider stopping at least temporarily or replacing uh, that offending agent at least until the symptoms resolve. Uh, and then follow these patients up to monitor progress. And some other notes, uh, studies have indicated that uh, if a mother has a diet high in rib riboflavin, uh, as well as saturated fats and nicotinamide, uh, this is associated with a lower incidence of congenital heart defects in uh, the baby. Uh, and then uh, also riboflavin is a photosensitizing agent, so patients who are uh, taking too much riboflavin, uh, they're at risk for sunburn. Uh, vitamin B3, that should say there, sorry for all the typos. Uh, vitamin B3 is niacin, and this is found in uh, also a very wide array of uh, foods, fish, poultry, meat, liver, peanuts, peas, seeds, and avocado. Niacin is a constituent of NAD and NADP, which is similar to FAD. Uh, those are important in redox reactions for donating and receiving protons, so they're going to be important for metabolism. Uh, it's also a function of the uh, respiratory chain. It's important for fatty acid and steroid synthesis. Uh, it's important for DNA processing and cell differentiation, so a very wide array of functions here. Deficiency occurs in the malnourished and the malabsorptive, as well as uh, patients whose diets are chiefly based off of corn. Um, that's something that you will see a lot in Central America and South America, not so much in the U.S. Illnesses such as anorexia nervosa and carcinoid syndrome can also precipitate a niacin deficiency. Manifestations uh, of vitamin B3 deficiency are very nonspecific uh, early on and include fatigue, dizziness, numbness, a loss of appetite. But in advanced disease, and usually when you see this present, it is pellagra. And pellagra is that stereotypical uh, syndrome that you learned about early on in medical school, and it's classified by all those Ds, and so here it is. Pellagra is dermatitis. Dermatitis looks, this dermatitis looks like a sunburn. There may be blisters. Usually it's in a cape-like distribution and on the face. So you'll see it on the face and on the arms, um, um, maybe on the upper neck. And it's often accompanied by stomatitis, canker sores, glossitis. Diarrhea can develop. Um, that may alternate with constipation. Depression, uh, usually which is a function of the delirium dementia. So you get delirium, which can include hallucinations. You, usually these are olfactory hallucinations. They can also have uh, really severe pain um, that's unevoked, and this can be confused with fibromyalgia. Dementia uh, includes emotional disturbances, forgetfulness, motor disturbances, uh, in which they'll become restless. Um, they can even become agitated. Dilated cardiomyopathy. Uh, may be present, and ultimately all of these things are going to lead to death if not treated. So uh, we've got seven Ds, dermatitis, diarrhea, depression, delirium, dementia, dilated cardiomyopathy, and death. That's pellagra. Somehow it came up with all those Ds.
I don't know how that is. So this is uh, that cape-like distribution of dermatitis. Um, this says that you can also see it uh, on the feet, so I guess you can see it there too. But you'll see it on the face, uh, on the neck, and on the arms. There's another case, particularly on the face. You know, you'd see this, you would think, oh, maybe lupus. But remember, you need to keep your differential. And I think she's also illustrating her glossitis here, but you can't really see it. The workup, if the patient has pellagra, then you can really just make a clinical diagnosis. Uh, there are no labs for detecting niacin, so the history and symptoms are really going to be paramount to making your diagnosis. Testing for other B vitamins is useful, especially vitamin B12, which can exacerbate fatigue. Folate can exacerbate fatigue as well. Uh, you can gather that suspicion based on the CBC with smears. If you see, uh, if you see hypersegmented neutrophils, enlarged red blood cells, that's consistent with, uh, with folate or B12 deficiency. Also, iron studies can be useful if you see a microcytic anemia. And then you also want to have a, a uh, metabolic profile as well. Uh, management is going to uh, be niacin administration, consultation with a specialist, including dietitian, but you can get consultation with a dermatologist or with a neurologist, depending on what symptoms are present. Avoid sun exposure, uh, at least until the dermatitis goes away, and then follow the patient up to monitor their progress. Now, as far as toxicity, I put that in quotes because there's really, it, it can't really, niacin really can't hurt you. Um, but there are some patients who we administer super doses of niacin to, and it's really a useful uh, tool to uh, reduce or to increase uh, HDL cholesterol and also to lower LDL cholesterol. And niacin is the single best uh, agent to raise HDL. It's very effective, and it also reduces LDL to a lesser extent. Um, these high doses that we usually put the patients on usually it's 1,000 milligrams, 2,000 milligrams, um, will typically, though, evoke a flush and an itchy, uh, usually warm pins and needles rash. Uh, not, not, not necessarily a rash, but uh, itchiness, um, sensation of warmth, uh, flushing, and that's just due to dilation of capillaries. Uh, patients, this, this is really unpleasant, and I can tell you that because I've, I've taken niacin, um, and I know what that feels like. And it's, it's really just a heat and prickly uh, sensation. Uh, patients will not like this, uh, but you should just remind them that it's temporary and inconsequential. And if it's, if it's really bad, they can take it with an aspirin, and uh, that will, uh, that will uh, reduce the symptoms. Also inform them that this reaction usually becomes less severe as the body habituates to the therapeutic level that you have them on. So here's me with a, my niacin flush. All right, vitamin B6 is pyridoxine, and this is found in sunflower seeds, fish, poultry, meat, fruits, especially dried fruits, bananas, avocados, and spinach. Pyridoxine is a coenzyme constituent in amino acid and glycogen metabolism. It is involved in the uh, in the uh, folic acid uh, and uh, homocysteine uh, B12 cycle. Uh, it's also useful in the synthesis of heme and neurotransmitters. And so this is why uh, you're, when you have a vitamin B deficiency, why you're getting that CBC with smear, uh, because there are some vitamin B deficiencies like folate and B12 that can lead to megaloblastic anemias. And then here we have vitamin B6, which can lead to, uh, to uh, low heme levels, and that's going to lead to a uh, microcytic anemia. So it's, uh, it's useful to, uh, to look at that red distribution with and at the red blood cells themselves. Vitamin B6 is also involved in steroid action. So notably, as I alluded to earlier, it's involved in the metabolism of homocysteine to cysteine, and so deficiency of vitamin B6 will result in elevated homocysteine level, and that's a really good uh, that's a really good lab to get to uh, to test for vitamin B6 deficiency. Deficiency of vitamin B6 is associated with low intake, uh, malabsorption, dialysis, 
Also some drugs uh, such as isoniazid, penicillamine, which is given uh, to patients with hemochromatosis, um, and also uh, steroids, um, anti-epileptic drugs. And, oh, I'm sorry, penicil uh, penicillamine is given uh, in uh, Wilson's disease. It's copper. Uh, steroids, AEDs, and uh, oral contraceptives. Uh, vitamin B6 uh, deficiency can also be associated with liver disease um, and other chronic inflammatory conditions. Uh, so there is a unique class of inborn metabolic disorders uh, that's known as the pyridoxine dependent states and uh, this is useful to know about particularly this first one because uh, when you're dealing with a, an infant with seizures, you should always consider a pyridoxine deficiency. Uh, so when you're managing a child with seizures, uh, especially a, a baby, uh, yes, you're going to administer, uh, you're, you're going to administer anti-epileptic drugs, uh, you can administer uh, barbiturates, but uh, it's also important to consider administering pyridoxine because there are some seizures that are going to be uh, that are going to be refractory uh, to uh, barbiturates and anti-epileptic drugs and they usually those will usually respond to pyridoxine. There's also pyridoxine dependent anemia, remember that it's involved in heme synthesis and also homocysteinuria is technically a B6 dependent state as well. Pyridoxine deficiency uh, typically manifests as listlessness, irritability, skin lesions like chelosis, glossitis, seborrheic dermatitis, is, uh, something that sort of uh, separates us out from some of the other vitamin B deficiencies, and also oxalic acid stones because it's uh, important in, uh, in, in uh, preventing the buildup of oxalate. In the pyridoxine dependent states, depending on the disorder, manifestations can include, as mentioned, seizures, microcytic anemia, and homocysteinuria. Usually homocysteinuria will be diagnosed on the newborn screening exam, but seizures and microcytic anemia might not pop up until later. CBC with smear is done, uh, plus or minus iron studies, depending on, uh, on how, how that comes out. Uh, it's going to be really, really suspicious for pyridoxine deficiency if you have a CBC, uh, which shows a microcytic anemia, but you have normal iron levels. BMP with calcium and magnesium levels will be good. This is just routine. And then a vitamin B6 profile. There's multiple forms of uh, B6, metabol uh, metabolized forms, um, and so you get a profile that shows you those forms. So we'll manage this with oral pyridoxine replacement, followed by adequate intake. Intramuscular replacement is going to be performed, not oral if there's seizures, obviously. Consultation with a dietitian, neurology, hematology if appropriate. Uh, in older patients, you should assess their vascular health. Homocysteine is very bad for the vessels, uh, so you want to make sure that you're uh, uh, listening to their renal arteries, listening to their carotid arteries, um, and then uh, referring them out necessary and then follow them up with uh, or follow them up uh, probably in in about a month uh, to monitor their progress. Biotin is probably uh, the least common to come up on the USMLE of, uh, of all these vitamin B uh, problems. Uh, but this is found in dairy, fish, nuts, poultry, leafy greens, legumes, mushrooms, and fruits. Uh, you can kind of see a lot of these are popping up a lot. Biotin is a cofactor for carboxylates. It's also involved in gluconeogenesis, fatty acid, and amino acid metabolism. Deficiency in biotin is, uh, is, is manifested in uh, a lot of uh, nonspecific symptoms, uh, lethargy, withdrawn behavior, hypotonia. Um, but uh, what you see uh, most characteristically is a periorificial dermatitis, and this is a dermatitis that will usually be around the eyes and around the mouth. The big cause here, um, it's probably most specific that I would expect if this does come up on a question uh, that you would see uh, on, on the vignette is going to be raw egg consumption. And raw eggs have a protein called avidin, uh, which uh, reduces uh, the amount of biotin you have. And this is just raw eggs. If you cook the eggs, it's going to denature that protein, so you don't have to worry about that. But if it's raw eggs, um, then... Uh, you can, uh, you can get this. 
Uh, parenteral nutrition, uh, if this is a hospitalized patient on parenteral nutrition, uh, with if they're getting formulas lacking biotin, and then uh, patients who are on uh, valproic acid. Workup, again, CBC with smear and iron studies, BMP with calcium and magnesium levels. If suspicion is high, you can get biotin levels, but this is rarely done in practice. Usually, you're going to suspect this based on the patient's history, if they're they eat raw eggs, if they're on valproic acid, if uh, they're on parental nutrition, and then also that uh, scaly periorificial dermatitis and alopecia. Uh, management is just simply biotin supplementation and uh, reduce or stop raw egg consumption. So here's periorificial dermatitis. I'm not sure if this is a biotin deficiency, but this is, this is periorificial dermatitis. Note that you have uh, dermatitis around the eyes, around the nares, and around the mouth. Okay, so let's just refamiliarize ourselves with the folate cycle here. And uh, this isn't just involving folate, but uh, uh, the folate cycle is important for uh, the metabolism of some of these other uh, chemicals here. Uh, so folic acid gets converted to tetrahydrofolate. Uh, there's a, an enzyme called M M MTHFR, which if it's, uh, if it's absent or reduced can cause homocysteinuria. Um, and that is going to convert 510-methylene-THF uh, to 5-methyl-THF uh, with the help of vitamin B12. So you see vitamin B12 popping up all over the place here, and also vitamin B6. When 5-methyl-THF is reconverted to THF, it donates its methyl group to homocysteine, which then becomes methionine. And so uh, homocysteine uh, gets converted back to methionine. And so if you don't have B12, homocysteine doesn't go into doesn't go back to methionine, and your homocysteine will uh, will accumulate. Uh, likewise, if you don't have folate, then you're not going to even go into this process at all. You're not going to have any 5-methyl tetrahydrofolate, and so homocysteine will accumulate in that case uh, as well, just for a different reason. Uh, so either due to a folate deficiency or a vitamin B12 deficiency. Vitamin B12, as we're going to see, is also important for the conversion of methylmalonic acid to methionine. And methylmalonic acid uh, is uh, a, a lab parameter that you can use to test B12 levels. Uh, if a patient is, uh, is, is high in both their MMA and their homocysteine levels, that points you towards the vitamin B12 deficiency, whereas if it's just homocysteine, um, they're going to be, uh, and MMA is normal, uh, that points to a folic acid deficiency because they still have, in that case, they have the B12 to uh, convert the MMA, so that'll be normal. Um, as we're going to see with vitamin B12 deficiencies, it's very important to, uh, to, to be able to convert these things because uh, it, you need to be able to uh, make this compound known as S-adenosyl methionine. This is important for myelination. And so this is what gives rise to those neurologic symptoms if you have a vitamin B12 deficiency. And all these enzymes can be involved in homocysteinuria. Folic acid is seen in vegetables, uh, especially the dark leafy greens, but you can also see it in citrus fruit uh, and other vegetables and fruits as well. The cofactor uh, of uh, folic acid is involved, as we have seen, in amino acid and nucleic acid metabolism. Uh, it's involved in the production of blood cells, uh, and that's why we see the megaloblastic anemia uh, that we do see if the patient is uh, deficient in folic acid. Of course, maternal intake uh, is highly stressed uh, in, in pregnancy um, because it reduces the risk of neural tube defects. The risk of deficiency increases uh, if there, uh, when there's an increased requirement because you're using folic acid more, uh, and that can be either due to growth, uh, but it can also be due to uh, hemolytic anemia or sickle cell disease. Uh, it can also be due to inadequate absorption uh, or if the patient is on anti-epileptic drugs. Uh, manifestations of folic acid deficiency, megaloblastic anemia is really the big one. Uh, and you'll, on the, when you do the smear, you'll see larger red blood cells, an increased red distribution width, and hypersegmented neutrophils. 
Syndromes that involve folic acid include the MTHFR mutation, which interrupts the folate cycle, as we saw. That causes homocystinuria. Cerebral folate deficiency is uh, sort of a unique one. Uh, this is something children are born with. And what happens is that you get an antibody that lodges into the blood-brain barrier, and that antibody traps folate and prevents it from getting into the brain. And so you have these neurologic symptoms caused by uh, deficient folate in the brain. Um, but uh, uh, you do have folate in the blood, so that's where you run into the problem. You're getting enough folate in your diet, but the folate is not getting in to uh, pass the blood-brain barrier. Uh, so the symptoms that you see here uh, would be irritability, microcephaly, developmental delay, cerebellar ataxia, pyramidal signs, um, and bilismus and choreoptosis. Uh, so all sorts of neurologic signs uh, involving the cortex, involving the cerebellum, and so forth. And the way to diagnose this is quite simple. Uh, you'll see normal plasma folate levels, but your CSF folate, which indicates the folate that's getting past the blood-brain barrier, is low or absent. And then finally, there's hereditary folate malabsorption. I just put this in here for completion's sake. This is a diagnosis of exclusion. It's incredibly rare. Uh, so these are just some syndromes that involve folic acid. Work up here is going to be BMP with calcium and magnesium levels, CBC with smear and iron studies, and B12 and folate levels. Uh, you definitely want to make sure you're getting B12 levels on these patients uh, because your CBC and smear are going to look just like uh, and B12 deficiency and folic acid deficiency look the exact same on smear. And you don't want to uh, just assume that this patient has, uh, has just low folate when they might have both low folate and low B12 or they might have low B12 because if you give the patient folate and they have uh, actually a deficiency in B12, it may mask some of their symptoms and some of the, the most of the symptoms from B12 deficiency are, some of them are irreversible. So you want to make sure that you know uh, they have a B12, uh, if their B12 is normal before you go ahead and treat them. Um, and you can either get folic acid and B12 levels directly, or the way I prefer is uh, getting homocysteine and MMA levels. Uh, remember then that if you have just a deficient homocysteine, you, uh, you've got folic acid uh, deficiency. If you have uh, reduced uh, homocysteine and MMA, then that points to a B12 deficiency. Management here is uh, folate replacement. Uh, that's vegetables. Adequate diet. Make sure that the B12 levels are normal for reasons that I mentioned. And consultation with a dietitian or other appropriate specialists can also be done. So we'll finish with vitamin B12, which is also known as cobalamin, and this is uh, found pretty much only in animal products, but it can also be found in certain fortified foods and cereals. So this is something that is an issue for people who are on vegetarian diets or vegan diets um, because they will not get this naturally through their diet, so they need to get it through fortified foods and cereals. So there's two different forms of vitamin B12 that uh, do different things. So the first one is deoxyadenosylcobalamin, and this is a cofactor for lipid and uh, carbohydrate metabolism. And then there's methylcobalamin, which is uh, responsible for that, uh, that conversion of homocysteine to methionine, um, and also uh, used for the uh, conversion of methylmalonyl-CoA to succinyl-CoA. So Converting homocysteine to methionine is very important. We kind of just talked about this earlier when we were looking at the folate cycle, but converting methionine um, uh, from homocysteine and getting that methionine is really, really important because this is a precursor for that s adenosyl methionine, or SAM. And SAM is important for myelin maintenance. So if you have a vitamin B12 deficiency, Invariably, you're going to get a SAM deficiency, and that's going to result in demyelination and damage to the neurons, and that's ir usually irreversible. And so that's, again, another reason why you want to make sure uh, that uh, if you're treating a patient, you think they have folate deficiency, just make sure that they don't have a B12 deficiency, too, uh, because, remember, vitamin B deficiencies tend to coincide with each other. 
As mentioned, vitamin B12 is found almost exclusively in animal products, uh, so meat, seafood, eggs, and milk. American diet is pretty heavy on the meat for most people, so we don't have a hard time getting B12. And vitamin B12 is also stored, uh, and so you have a, uh, a pretty... Uh, vitamin B12, you have to go a long time without eating these foods in order to uh, really develop a deficiency. People who are vegan or vegetarian can uh, get their B12 uh, by vitamin supplements or fortified foods. Uh, but you really need to stress this on anyone who is pursuing a vegan or vegetarian diet um, that they really do need to get B12. It's not unhealthy to pursue these diets. I'm not trying to push that. Um, but what I do want you to know is that if a patient is on one of these diets, you need to make them aware that these certain vitamins, like B12, are going to be vitamins that you won't find in your diet naturally, so you need to make sure you're either supplementing or that you're getting it through some kind of fortified food that's acceptable to your diet. Risk factors include such a diet, um, Crohn's ileitis, B12 is absorbed in the terminal ileum, so Crohn's disease that affects the ileum can affect B12 absorption. Pernicious anemia, um, which is an intrinsic factor deficiency that's necessary for the absorption of B12 as well. Manifestations of B12 deficiency include megaloblastic anemia, most notably, and then these, uh, these neurologic symptoms, so hypotonia, irritability, developmental delay, uh, choreoathetosis, involuntary movements, uh, sensory deficits, paresthesias, peripheral neuritis. Those are seen in adults more, and then um, in children, you can see this hyperpigmentation of palms and knuckles. I don't know why that happens, but it does. Again, you're going to work up these patients the exact same way. Get a uh, metabolic profile, uh, make sure that their uh, electrolytes are all good and in order, their kidneys working, uh, get a CBC with smear. Usually that's going to point you towards, uh, towards the megaloblastic anemia. Make sure you, uh, uh, though, uh, if, uh, uh, you may want to get, uh, if, if there's a really big uh, red distribution weight or if there's some, uh, if there's some uh, microcytic uh, cells, make sure you get iron studies because you can have an iron deficiency coexisting with these things. You can also have a B6 deficiency coexisting with these things. So uh, that can be, uh, that's generally useful as well. Uh, B12 and folate levels, of course, or you can just get homocysteine MMA levels of surrogates. Uh, management will be B B12 replacement, and that's usually what you do is you give that parentally, and that sort of serves as a depot, and then that's followed by an oral replacement. And then uh, you can have them consult with a uh, neurologist or dietitian, um, and then just make sure that you see these patients uh, later and make sure that they're... Uh, make sure that they're getting their B12. Usually you just follow that up with uh, homocysteine MMA levels and check their uh, CBC. So just to recap, uh, vitamin B1 deficiency associated with uh, alcohol malnutrition, uh, processed ri rice and wheat, um, that gives you beriberi, and that's neurologic and uh, car uh, cardiac symptoms. This is also where you see the Wernicke Korsakoff syndrome, typically in alcoholics. Riboflavin uh, deficiency is associated with malnutrition. Pretty much all of these are associated with malnutrition. Um, also with prolonged treatment uh, with probenicid, which is for gout, isoniazid, and OCPs. This is uh, generally manifested by angular colitis and uh, normocytic anemia. Vitamin B3 or niacin deficiency is associated with a corn-based diet and carcinoid syndrome. This is where you see pellagra. Vitamin B6 deficiency is associated with treatment with isoniazid, penicillamine, uh, oral contraceptives, and steroids. Here you see oxalate stones and seborrheic dermatitis. You can also see uh, patients who are in vitamin B6 deficient states or vitamin B6 dependent states, sorry, uh, who uh, may have seizures. Biotin is associated with the consumption of raw eggs. Periorificial dermatitis is uh, the most prominent manifestation. Folate deficiency is associated with a poor diet, metabolic errors, growth spurts, treatment with anti-epileptic drugs. Um, generally, this manifests as megaloblastic anemia with hypersegmented neutrophils. And finally, B12 deficiencies, that's associated with vegetarian and vegan diets, intrinsic anemia, and Crohn's and ileitis. This looks a lot like folate deficiency, except that 
You also, in adults, a lot of times, see the peripheral neuropathy in children because of that hyperpigmentation. And remember that all vitamin B deficiencies are associated with malabsorption.